have your Bibles, go with me to Isaiah chapter 53. If you don't know where Isaiah is, it's right in the middle of your Bible. So just open it up right to the middle and you will see Isaiah 53. And we're going to continue our series today on present pain and uh, future glory. And we're subtitling this, The First Gospel. I want you to really hear this, The First Gospel. And I know many people, even if you're kind of new to Scripture, you think, oh, that's Matthew. We're talking about the first gospel, Isaiah 53. And I believe Isaiah 53 is a revelation of God's infinite heart of entering into indescribable pain and suffering. That the suffering servant not only suffered, he surrendered to the suffering. That not only could he redeem us in suffering, but that he would come and he could redeem any pain, any trauma, any suffering that we've ever incurred, even abuse. Jesus Christ can heal us today. I believe this. Our theology must be bigger and greater than our pain to experience future glory. And our purpose is greater than our pain. And what awaits us is far greater than what uh, faces us. When we have a biblical theology on suffering and pain, it brings healing. And pain, suffering, abuse has no redemptive quality in and of itself. Uh, and you must know this, we're living in the end of times. Just this week, watching some of the news, and I try not to watch a lot of the news. If you're joyful and you want to become depressed, look at the news. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, but we are living in an apocalyptic time. And it's the end of the end of times. And the apocalyptic elements of our world are overwhelmingly painful. With the lockdown of our civilization along with a war, the beginnings, it looks like, of a global financial collapse, millions have awakened to the realization that something is terribly wrong that is happening right now. And our world is suffering, but I want you to know this. Our church, as a church, we have the only answer. We're not just an answer, but the only answer for the pain that is happening in this morning. I woke up and Isaiah, you must know this. I want you to go to 53. I'm going to read chapter 1, just the first verse. Isaiah is probably the greatest, one of the greatest books ever written in literature. It is the longest book in the entire Bible. Isaiah has 66 chapters. And you must know this, the Bible has 66 books. So it's as if in this one book, it's a capsule of all that have taken place and will take place. And in Isaiah's time, they had foreign nations, Sennacherib, a foreign enemy power, uh, came in and invaded and took over 46 cities in Judah. And his, his prophecy, this book, spans several kings in the kingdom of Judah. And this is what he says. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning, and you're going to begin to see him. When you see what he saw, you will know that there is a God. He said they saw uh, concerning Judah in Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. Remember Uzziah? I saw the Lord high and lifted up the time that Uzziah passed away. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Israel. And this morning, I felt a strong impression that, number one, we are living in apocalyptic times, but we, as a church, as a people, we're going to be like an Isaiah. We are going to begin to usher in, hear me, a new messianic era for the world because they need to know that we have a Savior and a God who did not stay in the bleachers when humanity began to suffer, became out of the bleachers, became a man, not only a human being, but was willing to go through indescribable pain that you and I can not only be healed, not only redeemed, not only saved, but me be made well and whole in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And this is the greatest, most thorough explanation of the theology of the atonement or healing or salvation. The gospel, Isaiah 53, is the answer to our world's present pain. And you must know this, there is no other uh, chapter in the Bible, no New Testament parallel than Isaiah 53. Just get this, one of the ancient commentaries says this, 
for whatever reason, if all the letters, the epistles of the New Testament, think of the letters of Paul, of Peter, of John, if they were removed from Scripture, if all we had was Isaiah 53, then it would be sufficient to explain the gospel. Because the gospel is not just a doctrine, it is a person who became a human being, the God-man suffered that you and I could be healed and experience future glory. Can you say amen? And so we're going to begin to read. Now look, in the Bible, when it was written, they didn't have chapters and verses. And in Jesus, there's only one time in Scripture that he actually reads from the Old Testament. And he goes to the book of Isaiah. And he reads in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to heal the sick, to heal the blind, and to set captives free. Can I say, I think the Spirit of the Lord has anointed City Church, California, to heal the sick, the blind, those who cannot see, their perspective is wrong. They're screaming, God, where are you? Well, you can stop screaming and start shouting. He's right here. And he's not just here. He's entered into your pain like no one else could ever enter into our pain. Why? Not only to heal us and save us, to make us whole, that we can heal the world. And I just got to say it right from the beginning. You cannot, I cannot heal the world if I'm still broken. Only healed people can become healers. And the world is ready for healers. Amen. Now, another guy, remember Philip was running. They had the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading Isaiah 53. And Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless someone explain it? So I'm here like Philip the evangelist to explain to us Isaiah 53. But remember, the original scroll didn't have chapters and verses. So you've got to go to Isaiah 52. And let's start with verse 15. This is important. Because in Isaiah... 53, it switches to a group of people talking, but in Isaiah 52, you're going to see he's speaking for God. Isaiah is speaking to God, and here it goes. It says, behold, this is verse 13, behold, my servant shall deal prudently, that means wisely, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished, did you get that, at you so his visage, that's his face, his countenance was marred more than any other man. I just want you to get that. Christ's face under the physical violent abuse, his face was disfigured. And it says this, in his form more than any of the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Now get this. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. I just want to read that again. Living in a woke culture where they're telling us what we can't talk about and not talk about. Well, I'm telling you, they're the original woke culture. And you know who they're not talking about? Oh, they'll talk about anyone. They'll talk about Buddha, Mohammed, Aristotle. They'll talk about this economy, that economy. But let me tell you what name that really drives them mad and crazy. And that is the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Last night in beautiful Ventura, hey world, why don't you move to California? Come to Ventura. It's the best place in all of California. We were downtown with our grandchildren last night and they had a family, this young middle school kid kept using the name of the Lord, J.C., Jesus Cristo, but he wasn't doing it in a praiseworthy way. It was almost like a curse way and he kept on just using that name, using that name, almost said, hey. Don't use it if you don't know it. And number two, why don't you say, Mohammed, you, Buddha, your mama. Come on. And you'll never know. Kings still speak the name of Aristotle. They still speak the name of Queen Elizabeth. Where is the leader that is willing to speak the name above every name? And it is the name that represents a God that became a man and entered into human suffering to heal our suffering. I think we need to give that name a hand clap. Come on. And he says this, he says, for what had not been told them, they shall see. 
We are living in a time, I think we're in a new Jesus people era. We're in the new messianic era where they may not have heard, but they're going to begin to see our God. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. I feel California is going to come into a consideration of God again. I believe Southern California is going to begin to think about God. When they go to our YouTube page, when they hear us on the podcast, when they come into the service, when they go to a group, I think they're going to begin to think about God and how good he is, how incredible he is, and how amazing he is. And he's the only one who could bring future glory out of this present pain. Yeah. Woo. I hadn't even started. You guys can get me wound up up in here. Okay, now go to 53. Now notice a change because instead of one person speaking, which he was speaking for God, Jehovah, he is now going to be speaking for a group of people. Let's go back, though, to Isaiah 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, wisely. An ancient rabbinic uh, commentary right around the 12th century says this, and it was a paraphrase of Isaiah. It says, behold, my servant, the Messiah. So they're saying it's the Messiah that will be this suffering servant. Now let's start Isaiah 53. Are you with me? Who has believed our report? Do you get that? It's past tense. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Today, you're going to have a revelation of the arm of God. Was that sun's out, guns out? Uh, no, why did it have to do that? Is that not dumb? Okay, now when it says the arm of the Lord is speaking about his power to change, to correct, and bring justice. Jesus says that God can literally move demon power. And we are living in a time where the violence is ferocious and demonic. That he could drive that out just with a flick of his finger. But God is going to show you. When people say the hurricanes, the earthquakes, Lord, that's not God's arm. God's arm doesn't come to destroy people. God's arm was fully revealed only on one. And that was his innocent son, Jesus Christ, the suffering Messiah. Amen? So here we go. It says this. It says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. So that is a sucker branch. It is a branch that does not give to the tree, but takes life from the tree. It's cut off and cast away. You know what we could say? It's the pain of having no worth. It's the pain of having no value. It's the pain of not being recognized. Now, can I say right now, if I'm God and I'm going to become a human being, I'm going to be an influencer on social media and everyone's going to want to follow me, but not the suffering servant. He has no value. Let's read on. It goes on, he says, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. And again, if I'm God and I'm becoming a man, I'm going to be on the cover of People magazine. But not God. It's the pain in the wound of just being very ordinary. And it goes on and says this. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I want you to get that. It says he's acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows. What that means is he was deeply embarrassed. If you've ever had a situation in your life that demoralized you, it shamed you, it put you in a cul-de-sac of hell where you can't get out, it, it, you become that pain. Today, there's a way out of that pit in that prison because God became a man. He was deeply embarrassed. He was deeply sorrowed, and he was deeply betrayed. But God says, you know what? I suffered that I can heal your pain, your wound, your abuse, your uh, mistrial. Can you say amen? And then let's read on. It goes on and it says this. It says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Let's just stop right there. There are people in here. It's one thing for a person to go through pain. It's another thing to go through it alone. 
where maybe friends, neighbors, relatives, maybe a spouse or an intimate family member comes and you're going through it alone. You must know something. I remember one of the darkest times of my life in Seattle. It was when we were in a ministry transition. And and it was like really, in, it was abruptly handled, and it was not right. And I was in the back part of the uh, parking lot of the church in Kirkland, Washington, and I began to grieve over that loss. And I remember thinking, I'm alone. And this is what came to me. Jesus said, Jude, in my darkest moment, I was in a garden, and I brought three of my closest friends with me, and they fell asleep. He said, when you go to the garden, he said, don't bring any friends with you because I'll meet you in the garden and I will talk with you, I will walk with you, and I will tell you I am your own. Then he goes this, and I love this next part. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Did you get that? He bore our griefs, he carried. That's literally grief when it comes. It, it, it's not only physical, it can come on the mind and the emotions of a person where it is debilitating. And it says, he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But get this next one, he was wounded for our transgressions. Stop right there, I'm going to say it again. He was wounded for our transgressions, but he was bruised for our iniquity. Did you get that? I want to say those two thoughts again. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Let me show you what a transgression is. For example, in the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not murder. Remember what Jesus said? He said, you've heard it of old. That's the law. That's Moses. That's the Torah. You've heard it say, thou shalt not murder. I say, thou shalt not have anger. So what is a transgression? If you take someone's life, you just transgress. You cross the line. Have you ever told someone, hey, you just crossed the line. No, you're going to have a piece of me. That is a transgression. What is another transgression? Jesus said, you've heard of all say, thou shall not commit adultery. Well, that means having sex outside of marriage. He said, but I say, if you have lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So that is a transgression. Now, please understand this. That Jesus was wounded, that is an outward wound, for every time we made a mistake. Am I the only imperfect person in this room today? Has anyone ever crossed the line? Okay, somebody's lying in here. Come on, who's ever speed? How many of you speed it, but you didn't speed it? <laughs> how, many, how many of you speeded it? How many of you have ever driving way too fast beyond the, the, uh, the zone or whatever, and you didn't get a ticket. You just said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> How many of you ever were speeding? You got a ticket. Okay, one of the things that really bothers me about my wife, she speeds all the time, but when she gets pulled over, she pours on the southern accent, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> she never gets a ticket. I tried that too. I got five tickets. Come on. <laughs> Okay, so you're with me. Now, listen to this. I want you to get this. The number two reasons why people will not believe in God, one is suffering. And they say, God, if you're so good, where are you? You're not really good at running the universe. I accepted you. Then why is this pain happening? Jesus Christ did not suffer that we can escape the evil pain that is in this world, but that when it comes our way, we could re be redeemed and be made whole through Jesus Christ. Now, get this. Two reasons. Number one, suffering. Another is science. Now, I don't know if you know this. They have a shroud. They have several shrouds. And now they put it to DNA testing in computer studies. And it's interesting. When we think, it says, now get this. We, he was wounded. That's an outward wound for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. We're going to get there in a moment. With this shroud, they see and they could tell that they didn't have just one Roman lictor. And you must know this. Now, the Hebrew, the Hebrew people had a law that you could not beat a man uh, more than 40. So it was 39 stripes. And that's why Paul says in Corinthians, I received 40 minus one blows. He received 
41 lashes. He was beat. That was an outward wound. But if you look at the shroud, you guys, it's unbelievable. They had at least two lictors, and one was taller than the other. One was left hand. The other was right hand. And when this whip, it was a flagra, it wasn't just one a uh, little, like with a whip that you see someone uh, trying to get cattle into line. No, this, each whip had other whips, three, six, and they had weights on it and hooks on it. And so the one lictor, they could tell by studying the shroud, he was taller because it went from the back all the way to the front, and his went further. The other was right hand, and it stopped. Jesus Christ, when it says he was wounded for your transgressions and my transgressions, and I just want you to know, I don't know why, but from an early age, I was a kid who loved to transgress. And if my mama said, Jude, in Louisiana, they had so many cracks in the sidewalk. That's how it is in Florida and Louisiana. And she said, don't step on the cracks. And, and I, I thought, and I'd, she'd look at me, I'd go, I'd step on every crack. A week later, said, Jude, don't step on the crack. And then I said, step on the crack, break your mother's back. Step on the crack. Have you ever heard that? And I was just transgressing. Can I tell you, Jesus Christ was wounded for every lie. Every time I crossed the line, you don't have to carry that anymore. Jesus Christ was wounded for your transgression. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to go back. I want you to get this. Go back and see this. And it says he was wounded for or bruised for our iniquities. Do you get that? He was bruised for our iniquity. How many of you ever had a bruise and someone touches it and you go, ow? How many of you ever had a bruise? Okay, you guys are acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, how many of you ever been in marriage counseling? Who needs marriage counseling? Who wants to go to marriage counseling? Well, I'm going to come on. I'll be your counselor. I'll be Dr. Phil right now. Let's go. Now, they call this a trigger. And, and the counselor, because Becky and I have been in counseling, they go, the counselor said to me, you really know how to push her buttons. I said, yeah, and she really knows how to push my buttons too. And what is that? That is a bruise. And it says he was bruised for our iniquity. And that means when touch, it's a pain there. And it's an internal pain. He was wounded externally, but he was bruised internally. Now, get this. He was bruised. People say, well, I was just born that way. That's why I'm doing it. I can't help it. I was born that way. Did you ever hear someone say that? I was just, I'm re living my authentic self. I don't want to live my authentic self when my authentic self is so bruised. I'm hurting people on the right and the left. I damage people at work. I damage people in my home. No, 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 no. I want to be healed of that original self. And can I say, well, I think this young man wants to clap, so I'm going to let him do it. One guy's going, yeah, that's my God. You know, you, you got to begin to get this. It says, I was, he was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquity. Can I say, yeah, I was born that way, and that's why I need to be born again another way that I don't have to react that way anymore. Now, let's go to this one. Let's go to verse, uh, uh, at the end of verse 5. The chastisement of our peace. Do you get that? The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Past tense. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed are healed. In the word chastisement literally means to be beat violently over and over and over again. What we are encountering with people in the last three years is different than anything I've ever seen in 36 years of ministry being in a local church. That it seems like the pain and what's happening to people is not just one source. It's coming in different directions, in different dimensions. In the South, they say when it rains, it pours. Can I say right now, when they wounded Jesus, they did it repeatedly, repeatedly. You think, Cobb, when is this going to let up? I have good news. When hell keeps striking, there's one one that died, that was buried, that rose on the third day, that we can have future glory through the Son of God who suffered for us. Yeah. Let's, let's move. Let's read more. Look at this one. It says, and by his stripes we are healed. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
How many of you sing the Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way? Uh Uh-uh, we don't sing that in this church. We sing Yahweh. (laughs) Oh, that's silly. Come on. I don't sing Yahweh. I sing Yahweh. How many of you ever heard of that one? Okay, let's move on. It says, we have turned every, hey, every one of us have gotten off the interstate here or there. And it says this to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's get this one. He was oppressed, oppressed and he was afflicted. Oppressed means it was a heavy weight. A heavy weight came on him. Now, in the Gospels, it shows that Christ, when he's carrying the cross from, to Golgotha, that he fell once. And a man came and helped him. On the shroud, it shows he fell three times. And one of the times that, that he felt that he had dirt, and they've done studies, it's dirt from Palestine in Jerusalem area. The second time he had dirt on his knees and his thigh. The third time, they said, he fell so hard that hundreds of pounds from the cross thrusting on him. And that when he was carrying the cross, it was probably chained to the two other criminals that were going to be executed that day. That he had even dirt on his nose and his face. When it says he was oppressed, and let me just say, there are people here today that maybe, and I'm I'm not making light of anything, you travel, you go on Southwest, Delta, Alaska, any flight, the amount of people that have service dogs, which I'm for, the anxiety of people living in our area is overwhelming. There is a heaviness. It's like they're being squatted upon. Jesus felt the weight of the sin of the world. You say, how did that look? He was in a garden, and it was so heavy, his sweat turned into blood. And the vessels in his face and the shroud proved that, began to uh, pop and burst. And and can I say right now, he was oppressed that you can be free. Come on, cast your weight, your oppression on him. He not only cares for you, he already cared for you. He'll always care for you. And listen to this, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. By the way, Jesus wasn't driven to the cross. He said, I lay my life down. Now get this, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Just stay right there. So he opened not his mouth. Usually, when I'm in pain, you say, how do you handle it? How do you mitigate? I talk about it, 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 talk about it. I'm doing this out. Talk about it, 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 talk about it. It's like taking a scab off a sore. It never heals. Can I say the way we could be delivered? Before you go to the phone, go to the throne and tell Jesus because he didn't open his mouth. And I'm not saying you don't process, you don't share. Surely there's counseling, there's ways. But I have to begin to turn and look how Jesus handled his pain. So get this, he says, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Come on, this is rejection. People see the person. If you're in Starbucks, they're going to drive to Pete's. That's a pain, it's a wound. It goes on, it says, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. What that means, usually when a man was crucified, they took his dead body and threw it in a trash heap. But it goes on and says, but with the rich at his death. Why? Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Please get verse 10. We're going to be ending soon. This I have to stop. It says, and yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I want to say it again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God is not sadistic. He's not a a, a sadist or a masochist. When it says it pleased him, it, it means that God, you have to understand something. The reason why God hates sin isn't because he's an ogre saying, how can we make their lives so boring? He hates sin because it destroys us. And he could not sweep it under the rug or kind of like, It's okay, give you one more shot. No, it kills us. It destroys us. When my wife, 10 years ago, was diagnosed with an incurable lymphoma, and we were at our house, and she was in a fetal position, Becky said this, listen, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? 
And she was saying, I've heard people on YouTube even say this, uh, don't waste your cancer. God gave you cancer. I've heard people say that God gave me my cancer, and they go to a doctor. I said, okay, do you believe in God? Yes. I said, do you believe it's his will for you to have cancer? Yes. And I said, then you better not go to a doctor so you can complete his will. I want to stop, and I want to say right now, I'll tell you what I told my wife when she said, what did I do? I said, Becky, we all did something to deserve the worst part punishment, but it pleased the Lord that the full force of his power and his justice would never come on us. It would come on his innocent son who did not open his mouth, that all the sin, all the anger, all the justice went out to Jesus. And what the Bible says when it says it pleased the Lord, it's not like he was giddy. The, the biblical word or the theology word is propitiation, that the wrath of God was a peace. You see, when we see the cross of Jesus Christ, I'm doing this not to show you that I have a large windspan here. Uh, I don't know what that is. But on the cross, on one side of the cross is the wrath of God. And it's the wrath of God justly poured out on his son. The other side of the cross is the love of God. The love of God fueled the wrath of God. And God's wrath isn't coming against you, Teresa, me, Jude, not you, Evan. No, no, Lucius, the wrath of God isn't coming on you because it already went out on the most innocent person who ever lived. And there is no God. There is no spiritual belief system. There is no energy. There's no philosophy. There's no leader in history that would literally 700 years before Isaiah was written, God himself began to write these words. These words are not just the words of a man. How can you know the exact number of what was happening? In fact, after the resurrection of the, uh, Jesus, the Jewish leaders forbid Jewish people to even read Isaiah 53 because they say it's the greatest and first gospel because the gospel is good news that all of God's righteous anger went on his son that it would not come on us. Come on, give the Lord a shout and a hand clap. Woo, somebody should shout on that. <clears throat> so in Hebrews 12, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It wasn't like Rocky. Remember the first Rocky movie, which is a great movie. Hit me, hit me. He wasn't Rocky. He's not Sylvester Stallone. We got, what it is saying that Jesus Christ surrendered and was willing to be brutally beaten beyond recognition that you and I in our suffering could be made whole and well. Can you say, yes, Lord? And so it's, it, the joy is satisfaction, is propitiation, that his wrath has been appeased. So when I told my wife, I said, Becky, we can't think that way because all that you deserved and I deserved, and I deserved a lot more than her. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't make me feel bad. That makes me feel more loved. Because he who has loved much, I mean forgiven much, loves much. Did you hear what I just said? Okay, back to Isaiah. Come on, come on. It says here, and I love this, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. Now, I'm going to invite the band to come up. You need to get this. Jesus always referred to God as Father. He said, I only say what I hear the Father saying. I only do what I see the Father doing, except one. Except one. It was when he was on the cross. Please get this. And it says his soul was in agony, and he did these words. My God, where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? How can I even believe God, where are you? And anyone in here, if you've ever had pain, abuse, betrayal, suffering, woundedness, that is your first inclination. And it erupts out of us. My God, where are you? And right before he yielded his own spirit, he then said these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know, even if they do know. You see, the Jewish people, they thought he was being crucified because he sinned. He being a man, making himself to be God, which is blasphemy. 
And they thought it was a just crucifixion. That the most innocent man who ever lived was brutally, unjustly, and prematurely his life was taken. But yet, you know what he told Pilate? You can't take my life. No man could take my life because I can raise it up again. There is no God like our God. Come on, Stephen Hawkins, really? He was going to come up with a mathematical formula that would heal the universe. I think we sinners need more than a math problem. And I don't know about you, but it humbles me. And I'm more aware of my sin and my shame than anyone. But there is a depth of gratitude within my soul that 700 years before Christ would be born of a virgin, God begins to pin so intricately these words through Isaiah that every time I felt betrayed, alone, that I felt it was so unjust, I, I, I cursed, I became manic. There's a God who bleeds. And there's a God who was willing to enter human suffering, not only to redeem us, but to begin to bring wholeness to our own brokenness. We are now starting a messianic era. We are not only activating the altar, first of all, of our hearts, then at this altar. But our altar call in activating the power of the cross of Jesus Christ is not just for us. It's for California. It's for the world. We can't heal them if we're not healed. And God doesn't want us to put a broken, I mean, a Band-Aid on something that's fractured. And I don't know about you. It's not a simple break. My soul splintered into a fracture. I needed this suffering Messiah, the servant. You know what one rabbinic commentary called him? The sick Messiah. That he became sick, that we can become well. Let's finish reading, and then we will end. Let's, here it goes. It says this, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, well, this is next part. This is future glory. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and, get this, be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. I love that. Then he goes, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin. He bore my sin. I have a lot. And he did it if I was the only person on the planet. He bore my sin and made intercession for this transgressor. He's still praying for me. The first time I ever experienced death, really, I was in eighth grade. I was about 14 years old. It was my Aunt Betty Lee. She passed away. She was really the first person, as I got older, to see in a casket. I'll never forget with her mother... Sister Bernice, Aunt Bernice said, it made me make a vow as a 14-year-old boy. She was, you see, Aunt Betty Lee was an only child. They were from Ohio. She married my dad's brother, Everett, good-looking French man. And, but Aunt Betty Lee was an only child. Her mother, at the foot of her casket, in the South back then, shoot, they had memorial services for three days. I mean, they, they carried it out. And Miss Bernice would go at the foot of her only child's casket. I still hear it. I still see her face. My Betty Lee. My Betty Lee. It shouldn't have been this way. I should have went before you. And can I say, God said somewhat the same. My son. Jesus said, my God, my God, that the Father was saying, my son, my innocent son, the, the reason it pleased the Lord, because from the foundations of the world, get this, in the book of Revelation, the innocent lamb is in that book, it talks about the lamb, the lamb, the lamb, 28 times, yet in Isaiah 53, like a lamb, 
that has led to the slaughter keeps his mouth quiet. Then the next one would be at the grave site of my father. I wasn't into scripture. Our family wasn't like spiritual people. We were Catholics, but good God, we were pathetic Catholics. We left after communion, usually went to mass intoxicated, definitely went on Easter, uh, put ashes on our head, and they go, what are you giving up for Lent? I said, homework. <laughs> Mom said, you, you have to get some food, spinach. Daddy died unexpectedly at 16. My sister and I, my twin sister, can you imagine? You want to talk about trauma, triggers, looping, drives you into mental unhealthiness. Julian, I just had his hands. I still see him. I see him. And we looked at a body that didn't move. And when we would go to the cemetery and they begin to lower that casket, think this is crazy, but I'm going to say it the only way I should say it. I think a part of woke culture, always trying to make it Christianity 2.0. I think we need the full effects of the Bible. We say, oh, I had the impression. No, God spoke to me. And I didn't even know he spoke. And he said these words, I will be a father to you. Years would pass, I would read in the Bible, he will be a father to the fatherless. And surely, through the pain, through things that I would have never thought or planned, we live in a broken world. Paul calls it this present evil age. And Jesus in suffering redeemed me. But as I began to see the revelation of Isaiah 53, it can heal me. And if it heals me, then I can heal the world. We are now in a new Jesus people era. And thousands to hundreds of thousands of people are going to come into the great kingdom of God, and they will be new people. The bad thing, really, one of the dangers I could say are the wretched, ferociously demonic things about experiencing trauma, pain, woundedness, betrayal, relentless abuse is that you begin to identify with it. The guy who has a drinking problem, the guy who has this problem, the girl who has this problem. Well, I have good news for you. Jesus didn't die just to forgive us. He died to make us new people. He died to make us a new type of creation. He died to make us men and women that whoever is in Jesus, the old is gone and the new has come. You may have been abandoned. You may have been rejected. You may have been slaughtered by those around you. But I stand before you. The world awaits us to tell them there is a revelation of our God. And he cannot be compared to any other God. If God was an actor, then he's getting the golden uh, award. He's got the Oscar. He's got the Grammy. He's got every award. There is no God. The Buddha didn't do it. Mohammed didn't do it. Socrates didn't do it. Aristotle couldn't do it. Only God can see something 700 years. Come on, we don't even know what's going to happen next week in the election. But we are not basing our lives on that. You better vote, though. You better vote. Young people, a lot of you are not clapping. And I'll tell you why you're not clapping. Because you don't know what it is to have a child and a grandchild in this world that we now find ourselves in. And people have been telling me, Pastor Jude, I don't know if they should have children anymore. I said, shut up. Oh, we can't say that. Church. Be quiet. Now's the greatest time to have a child. Because Isaiah said, unto us 
a child will be born and the government will rest on his shoulders. He'll be a wonderful counselor. It's the next word that trips it up. Mighty God, everlasting peace. That is our God. Come on. Amen. Shout this out with me. Say, Father, forgive them. They don't know. Even if they did know, they didn't know. No, you don't have to say all that. You guys are. May I tell you one last story? When my dad died, one of the things I refused to do at first as a pastor was to officiate a funeral. And it's interesting, the Lord. In each church I've been in, I don't know why, I was the one who officiated all the funerals. And it was hard for me to go by an open casket. I've officiated probably 150 funerals in a 36 year period. I can't forget this one. It was a young man who was a, then was the age of my oldest son. He was nearly a perfect kid, smart. He was homeschooled, but in Seattle, they had this homeschool association co-op where they would have activities. They, would ha they had a graduation. He had just graduated from homeschool, yeah, but it was a real graduation with others, hundreds that were homeschooled in this program. And in him and one of his best friends were driving. It was about 12.30 to 1.30 in the morning and a drunk driver ran a red light going at least 80 to 100 miles an hour and both of them's lives were taken immediately. I still see that woman's face, his mother. She came with a shoe box. They didn't have like all the pictures on Instagram. It's so cool now. You don't need the shoe box. You just get iCloud and you have it. She dumped the pictures on my desk that pic, she, this is when we took him home. I have the same picture of my juke on his face. It's them, first time holding a bottle. I have the same picture of my son. Then when they take the first step, then when they go to preschool, then elementary, then the baseball, the boys and girls club, basketball, same pictures. Even had like a prom picture, same picture. She said these words, Pastor Jude, I just need you to make some sense out of this for me. This is my boy. And so the sanctuary was filled with people. Maybe 2,000 people were there that day. And I'm sitting, his first cousin's on the piano. He wrote a song for his cousin. He said, before I sing this song, I just want to ask God one question. Why? Why? Jenny Smith, my pastor's wife, she, she has very good posture. She was sitting. You know how some women who are very classy, and she had great posture. Her ankles were crossed. I mean, her legs were crossed at the ankle. I just want to ask God one question. She leans over to me. Now, Pastor Jude, you're going to have to answer that question. me in my poor posture do you have any ideas no but the Lord will help you God spoke to me he said that is not the first time in history that's happened he said my son my only begotten son who is not just good and not just innocent, not just promising. He was 100% God and 100% man. And he willingly surrendered to the suffering, not because of his own fault, but because of the sin of the whole world, the iniquity of all of human history. And his suffering was so horrendous that it cannot be compared to anyone's suffering. And when I got up, that's what I told him. I said, this is painful, but you must know that God 
entered into indescribable, un unimaginable pain by sending his spotless, righteous son to become sin that you and I might become righteous and have a right relationship with God Almighty. Can I tell you right now, no matter what you've been through, if you begin to read, Luther said this, every believer should memorize Isaiah 53. And for the record, it doesn't say we'll be healed. We're healed. And he doesn't say, I will believe when things turn around. Well, can I tell you, I'm voting, and I know how I'm voting and what I'm believing for next Tuesday. However, should it not go my way, don't you dare think I'm going to give up on the report of the Lord. Who has believed our report? Our report is that our God is alive. Our God is good. Our God is a miracle worker. Our God suffered like no one has ever suffered. And our God enters into our pain to heal us, to restore us, to deliver us. Now that is a God. There is no God like our God. Where is the God that's done what he's done for the human race? There is no God like Jesus. He became sick. He became sick. He was beat. He was abused. He was brutalized. Why? that you and I can be healed. I am not going to carry a stigma. I am not going to carry the stain of the past. I will walk in the newness of life, says God. Give the Lord a shout and a hand clap. My goodness.